Welcome, everyone, to the Pediatric Hospital Medicine podcast series. I am your host, Dr. Tony Tarcici, coming to you from Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh of UPMC. In case you're new to the podcast, I am a MedPeds trained physician working as a pediatric hospital here at Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh in the Paul C. Gaffney Diagnostic Referral Group. This is our eighth podcast in our Pediatric Hospital Medicine podcast series. Typically, what we've been doing is marching our way through the core competencies in pediatric hospital medicine. Uh, Today is a special podcast, and I'm really excited about it. Now, just so you know, normally, we give free CME credit to anybody who listens to the podcast uh, just for listening. It's something we've been doing through the University of Pittsburgh, which we're really happy to do. But today, we are not going to offer CME credit for the podcast we're about to do because this one is a little bit different. I'm fortunate enough to have two very special guests with me. What we're going to do is talk about Texas Children's Hospital at Baylor in Houston, Texas, and their response during Hurricane Harvey. What happened to them, uh, what went on, what didn't go on. And one of the local shelters, their medical director is also with us, and we're going to talk about what happened in Houston. We're going to talk about what happened to them during Hurricane Harvey. So let's do our disclaimer, and then we'll get right into it. This podcast is for general informational educational purposes only and is not to be considered medical advice for any particular patient. Clinicians must rely on their own informed clinical judgments when making recommendations for their patients. With that being said, I am very fortunate enough to be joined by two physicians from Texas Children's Hospital at Houston, Texas. Dr. Brent Kasney is a pediatric emergency medicine physician and the Physician Lead of Emergency Management at Texas Children's Hospital. And Dr. Saranya Srinivasan is an Assistant Medical Director for the Houston Fire Department, Director of EMS for uh, for Texas Children's Hospital. So thank you both for being on the podcast. I really appreciate taking the time out of your schedules. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you for having us. So now this, this is not something, at least I see very often in terms of these significant disasters. Now, just to remind everybody, because it has been a little while and it's been out of the news because of the other two hurricanes that have hit, but Hurricane Harvey hit Houston on August 25th, 2017. So a a little over a month, a little more than a month ago. That date sounds right to you too, right? Yeah, it hit on the 26th. On the 26th, August. So exactly a month ago, August 26th. Okay. Let's start with the beginning. What preparations, when you saw the storm was coming, what preparations were made at Texas Children's? So at Texas Children's, you know, we're, we're pretty used to dealing with hurricane events, and we actually drill for hurricane events every year. So we have a pretty high-level administrative drill that takes place looking at how to prepare for hurricanes. And so really we just enacted what our plan is, and that usually involves the week preceding when the storm is supposed to make landfall, we start tracking the storm. So really early on in the thing, we're watching the storm, We actually contract a meteorologic service that gives us real-time updates on what they're thinking and what the probability they think that the storm is going to hit us. And we start positioning resources. Primarily, that's the initial phase is getting things like fuel and water and food prepared and ready as we kind of get near and near what we we call kind of our our ride out. So you'll have to forgive me for my, I guess, my ignorance on the topic. How often do hurricanes hit Houston? So we've seen some, you know, pretty significant hurricane events over the course of the last, you know, 10 years, if you think about. So going back 12 years, we had Hurricane Rita, which was right after Katrina. And that wasn't much of a hurricane event, but the mass evacuation of Houston led to a lot of issues. And then we've had Hurricane Ike after that, which was a pretty significant event. And then obviously Harvey. Something, though, that we've been seeing more frequently is when you look at, like, the last three years, we've had a lot of uh, major flash flood events. So a couple of years ago, we had the uh, the tax day flood and the Memorial Day floods over the course of the last three years. And those were pretty, pretty significant flooding events throughout the city. So that's something I think we've become even more kind of used to is these flash flood events. Now, and I don't want to get uh, too geographic, but one of the things I did want to ask, I lo- looking at a map of Houston, what is it that floods? Is it Trinity Bay overflows in, or is it one of the rivers? What what overflows to cause the flood? So there's actually a number of watersheds for the greater Houston metropolitan area. The two most significant to our discussion is really Buffalo Bayou, which really 
kind of leads to downtown, and so that uh, causes flooding of downtown, the downtown area, and then Bray's Bayou, which floods the medical center. Okay. Now, you've had these flash flooding events before. One of the things I wanted to ask was, how do you prepare for flooding? You can prepare for a storm, but how do you prepare for flooding? And did you ever think of preparing for flooding to the magnitude that you had? That's been one of our challenges, I think, with emergency management is because when you have a, you know, when you have a hurricane coming, you kind of have this advanced notice, you know, the storm is kind of coming in the Gulf and it's headed towards Houston and we have some, you know, models that are predicting where it's going to go. But what we've noticed with these flash flood events over the last, you know, three to five years is that they're much more difficult to predict. And so that has been a challenge. I think with Harvey, given that it was linked, this flooding event was linked to a hurricane, it did give us that kind of advanced notice to do a lot of preparations. But we've done we've done kind of some minor preparations for these other flash flood events, which usually result in a lot of street flooding that then subsides pretty quickly. So there's kind of hours to maybe, you know, a day where things are impassable, but that's the extent of it. With Harvey, it was much more of a drawn out response just given the nature of the storm okay okay so now when the storm hit and then the flooding started can you describe the scene and what happened at the hospital itself so you know initially we were kind of sheltered in place and, and hunkered down as the ride out team at texas children starting that saturday morning and it was interesting because that saturday there was really very little if any rain it was actually the weather was pretty nice outside and we had really kind of gotten everyone in house that needed to be in house. So physicians, nurses, you know, environmental services, you name it, that you need to run the hospital. We had them in place, ready to work for a three to five day period as we were kind of expecting the storm to come. And Saturday was really actually pretty, the weather was not bad. But as kind of everyone went to sleep Saturday night, we started to have rains in the late evening. Uh, and then when we woke up, when people woke up Sunday morning or people that had been working overnight paid attention as the sun came up, we saw, you know, obviously some pretty, pretty significant flooding in, in and around the medical center that we could see out the windows of the hospital. Okay. Now at that point, those physicians and nurses that were there Saturday stayed over. Yeah. So we basically had everyone that you would need to kind of maintain full operations in house on Saturday morning. So physicians, nurses, any kind of staff that you would need to keep the hospital operational. We had in, in place Saturday morning with the thought that we would do, you know, trade out. And every clinical section did that a little bit different, how they did their shifts or did their clinical clinical work and trading out. But we basically had everyone in place to run operations relatively indefinitely. So how long did that, that group of physicians and nurses and staff have to stay in the hospital? How long were they stuck there? So when they came on Saturday morning, our initial thought was that this could be something that lasted three to five days. We knew from talking to the meteorologist that this was a little bit different than past hurricane events that would just kind of, you know, sweep into the town and, and go through go through Houston and then move on. And this was something that was going to linger more and could produce kind of prolonged rains and prolonged flooding. And so we really told everybody when they were coming in that Saturday morning that they should be kind of expected or prepared to stay for three to five days. How long did they stay for? So <clears throat> we were lucky in that there was kind of a break in the storm where we weren't sure how things were going to go, but it seemed like the weather kind of a window of opportunity on Monday where we were actually able to swap out a lot of the clinical staff. Okay. So most physicians had some sort of relief on Monday as well as some of the nurses uh, throughout. So there were nurses and physicians that stayed there through Wednesday to into Thursday, and then others that were traded out on Monday and then got some relief. I can tell you, I got there Friday morning for a, a shift Friday morning, and I ended up leaving to go home to sleep in my own bed uh, Tuesday night. Tuesday night. The physicians that they were able to swap out, how did, were, I mean, and I don't know, I'm only going by what I saw on the news and what I've read online, were, they, were the other doctors boated in, or were the streets drivable at that point? So the med center was pretty fortunate that while we saw a lot of uh, impassable roads that Sunday morning, uh, it quickly subsided. You know, they've done a ton of improvements on drainage and the Braze Bayou watershed as a, after uh, Tropical Storm Allison, which was another kind of historic flooding event that really significantly impacted the medical center. 
And as a result of those improvements, while there was a lot of flooding in the medical center itself, that went down rather quickly and it made it so we could actually get in and out of the medical center relatively easily after Tuesday. I mean, after Monday, sorry. So at the medical center, Texas Children's, did you have to evacuate any patients or move any patients? So we did not have to evacuate any of our patients from any of our hospitals. We actually have our main campus in the medical center, and then we have a, two community sites. One is out west of downtown, about 30 miles. It's our Texas Children's West Campus. And we have another that's about 45 minutes north of downtown called Texas Children's The Woodlands. And none of our facilities uh, needed to evacuate any patients. So did the hospital take in any end up having to take in patients or people who were stuck, who the flooding caused them to be trapped? Uh, did, did that happen? So we did receive some patients from a couple of other facilities, mostly high-risk OB patients from a nearby hospital were evacuated to our pavilion for women. But really beyond that, we didn't receive a, lo a large influx of evacuated patients, which is really what we want in this situation, because we want people that need to be evacuated from kind of the area significantly impacted to get out of that area. There were people that were essentially being rescued by the Coast Guard and taken to one of our uh, community sites. So our West Campus site that's 30 miles west of downtown. There were people that basically were evacuated from their homes and then taken there. And they were essentially from there, we assisted them in, in directing them to a nearby shelter. So Brent, for those listening who have never been to Texas Children's and don't know anything about it, can you describe the size of the hospital? I'm assuming it's a tertiary care facility. Uh, just some statistics so people can know uh, how big of a hospital we're talking about. Yeah, sure. So Texas Children's Hospital is one of the largest children's hospitals in the country. It's ranked number four by U.S. News and World Report. We have a large PICU and CBICU at our main campus, as well as a level, level four, NICU. four NICU. Okay. At our community sites, we have PICUs at both of those sites. And at our site in the Woodlands, we also have a NICU. Okay. And I'm, I'm looking here. It looks like it's 592 beds. Yeah, yeah. That sounds correct. And in 2013, we had 3.2 million patient encounters and would perform about 25,000 surgeries a year. So very large, very busy hospital. That's very large. Sure. Did the hospital end up having any power issues during Harvey at all? So we did not have any power issues at our main campus. We remained on the, the local grid there. Given that that's in the, in the Texas Medical Center, the power grid there is actually very robust. It's kind of built up to, to be you know, able to withstand a lot of these types of events. Our hospital out in West Campus was on backup generator for a period of time during the storm. But largely that was because of the fact that as they go about repairing uh, electrical issues in the community, they kind of shut off and on the power and to maintain a steady stream of electrical flow without having to worry about the generators kicking on and off. We just went on backup generator throughout most of the storm. Okay. Did you guys lose any technology, whether it was EMR, cell phones, internet? No. So I think one of our, one of the saving graces of this disaster was that we were able to use, you know, cell phones, regular phones, pagers, everything really from a communication standpoint was working as it's supposed to. And then in addition to that, our you know electronic health record you know, remained online and we did not have any problems with that either. So I think that made things much easier for us as we kind of weathered the storm. It's interesting because what we heard on CNN and on the news was how, how terrible the flooding is. And from what you're, you're describing, and then don't, please correct me if I'm wrong, Texas Children's Seemed to weather it well. There wasn't a ton of damage. The patients weren't moved or affected. And it didn't seem to have hit you guys as hard as maybe it hit other places in Houston. Is that fair? Well, I think a lot of that has to do with some of the, the facilities, the structures, and the preparatory work that Texas Children's has done. So there were, there were hospitals in the medical center that flooded, definitely. We are uniquely kind of designed in that, you know, while we have basement levels, we have flood doors that we can close in those basement levels that are essentially like large submarine doors that shut us off from the rest of kind of the underground network at, at Tex oh, in the Texas Medical Center and prevent us from really flooding on those lower levels. But there was, there were other hospitals in the medical center that flooded and, and definitely sustained 
more damage. I think we just happen to have extremely, you know, sturdy facilities that led to us, you know, weathering the storm relative with relative ease from that standpoint. We did have leaks. We definitely had some minor leaks throughout the hospital in, in different locations. But again, looking to kind of the foresight of some of our facilities managers and leaders at the institution from an administrative standpoint, we even had a, a team of flood remediation experts that we contracted with that came into the hospital before the storm so that if there were any leaks, they could immediately respond and take care of that. So I think it just goes to show you kind of some of the forethought that went into, you know, getting the team together and and having people in place and positioned uh, to take care of things as they, as they arose. Yeah. It seems like the preparation you guys just about thought of everything, but let me ask you, did anything surprise you? Did you have to improvise during the storm? And then if so, what was it? I think one of the biggest challenges that we were faced with, you know, kind of from a clinical standpoint had to do more with complex care patients patients in need of kind of chronic medical needs. In particular, our patients that require chronic dialysis. So kids that were out there in the community in need of help posed a unique challenge. I think there were a number of specialties that were receiving calls from their patients, you know, saying that their homes were flooding and asking for assistance for a variety of different types of medical issues. And I think that was one of the things that I, I think we kind of highlighted as something that we need to look deeper at and how to how to solve those issues but you know as an example i can tell you with our chronic dialysis patients there were 23 patients out in the community that needed dialysis you know life-sustaining treatment and we had to arrange for them to make it into the hospital many of them their homes were flooded their neighborhoods were flooded and so a lot of them went to pretty tremendous through pretty tremendous efforts to make it into the hospital The head of our renal department actually coordinated with the Coast Guard to bring some of the patients in. I know there was one patient that came in in part by Coast Guard, but also there were boats and high water vehicles involved in him making it into the hospital. So I think this issue of complex care kids that are in the community and that receive very subspecialized care at our facility uh, was a unique challenge. I mean, there were thoughts about sending those patients to other facilities outside of Houston, But the reality of it is 23 dialysis patients, pediatric dialysis patients, would very quickly overwhelm pretty much any other uh, major children's hospital in Texas. And so I think that was one of the unique challenges that we faced. That sounds like a challenge that would be tough to figure out. But um, from what I'm hearing, I'm sure by the next storm, hopefully there isn't one, you guys will have had that worked out. So your staff that you had stayed there, they were very dedicated. They they seemed to were there no matter no matter what, how did they prepare their family? How, what did you tell them? What did you tell them to tell their family or to prepare their family? How did that work out? You know, one thing that we've been very, I think, upfront about is that we really don't want people bringing their families with them to the hospital in these situations, especially physicians and staff. Um, we do have a plan in place for what we call dependent care. So if there is a need for you know, people that need to be in the hospital and they have nothing else, they have no other kind of backup care plan or don't have a spouse that can take their child and evacuate or hunker down at home, we can arrange for uh, dependent care in the facility, in the hospital for them. We were fortunate that we didn't really have to enact that plan this time. We were able to work with staff that didn't didn't need that. But I think it's always a challenge. I, I know one of our critical care docs, he always thinks it's funny that my wife is basically just totally fine with the fact that you know, if there's a gas leak, I go to the hospital. If there's a potential patient with Ebola, I go to the hospital. If there's a hurricane, I go to the hospital. And she's pretty fine with it. And I think it's just, you know, the nature of she knows what my job and my position is with emergency management and disaster preparedness and response. But we just relate to people, you know, I think to make sure that your family is kind of prepared and safe. I think in a lot of the messaging and communications that we give about what we're doing at the hospital, we always preach personal preparedness. Because I think personal preparedness is kind of the cornerstone for community resiliency. And so we talk about those things with our with our faculty and staff as well as we're kind of preparing for these things. So is there anything else that happened during the storm that either surprised you or really showed just how dedicated your staff is or anything that you want to discuss or share? Yeah, I mean, I think we are very fortunate at Texas Children's to have, you know, administrative leadership that's there. So I think it's you know important to point out that it's not just physicians and nurses that are there, but there are executive vice presidents that are there staying five days in the hospital, taking out you know 12-hour shifts on and off. There are a number of 
administrative leaders, position leaders, our emergency management team that is a, a great team of people that work together during these things. We're all there in-house as well. And that's what really I think you need to make these things run smoothly. So it's hard to have, I think, physicians that are doing this all by themselves, but you definitely need physician in, in, in inclusion in the planning. And it's hard to have it just be emergency management by themselves. You really need that commitment from the administration that this is something that's important and that they're going to make sure things go smoothly. Because we all know there are those people that work at the hospital that just know how to get things done. You know, they're the people that you call when something's not right or something needs to get fixed. And those are the people that you want in place there. Uh, the people that when you see something that's not happening the way it's supposed to, you pick up the phone and call them and they get it taken care of. And it really, I think, involves those people and those people's commitment to, to the institution to weather a storm like this and get through something like Hurricane Harvey. But I mean, I can't say enough about our staff. The nurses were ter- tremendous. Most of them actually stayed throughout the entire you know, five to six days doing 12 on and 12 off. One of the big challenges that we had was at a point you get to you get to a point in the storm where there's a number of people that aren't sure what the status of their home is. So they're in the hospital and they don't know if their home is flooded or not. And so trying to figure that information out was really important and, and really trying to make it where we knew who could go home. So I kind of earlier had mentioned that we did this swap out of people, but it was it was difficult to say who thinks they can make it home safely and who thinks they can get into the hospital safely. And so that was, I think, another challenge that we faced. By and large, I think everybody kind of took everything in stride and kind of, you know, really just dealt with things as they came and and healed it in a very uh, admirable way. Sounds like you're absolutely right. And I will say from the perspective of an outsider listening in, in terms of lessons uh, for other children's hospitals for these types of situations, it sounds like you had a combination of a well-built structure. So thoughtful planning in the structure itself with the submarine doors and everything else. Uh, Significant preparation because of issues that you've had with flooding and bad storms and a very dedicated staff from the top down. Would you agree? I would definitely agree. I mean, I I think we're very fortunate to work with the people that we work with. And I think, you know, going through something like this is when you really see that commitment and that level of dedication. It's easy when we do drills and things like that to see people kind of get excited about, you know, playing through these scenarios. But when you when you actually have something so horrible hit your city, I think it, uh, it goes to show you that these people are actually very committed. So now, Dr. Srinivasan, I want to bring you in on this. You were the shelter medical director and, if I'm not mistaken, the sole pediatrician at the George R. Brown Shelter. Is that correct? That is correct. So I was a sole pediatrician there, and the shelter was being staffed by physicians working for the Houston Fire Department. So there were a total of about three to four of us who were actually able to get into the shelter. Dr. David Purse, who is the public health authority for the city of Houston, was there, and then a few other physicians and I were there. So while Dr. Purse was taking care of things on a federal level, we were responsible for setting up essentially the medical care in the shelter. Now, where is the shelter in terms of the city? Is it in the center of the city? Was it where the flooding was? Where was the shelter? So the shelter is downtown Houston. There were areas around the shelter that were flooded, including some of the major roads. But uh, the shelter is downtown, so it's a relatively central location. And what is that building when it's not a shelter? Um, So it's the George R. Brown Convention Center, and they hold a number of large events and conventions there. For example, when Super Bowl was in Houston, it was where a lot of the Super Bowl events were being held, including the NFL uh, experience and Super Bowl Live. So normally it's a for-profit convention center that hosts a variety of events. Oh, okay. So now when the storm hits and the flooding starts, you're there, what happens? So for me, it was actually an interesting story because I was actually not in Houston when the storm was going to hit. I was in Dallas doing actually something EMS and disaster medicine related from Thursday through Saturday. And on Friday, we heard how bad the storm was going to be. Everyone else from Houston offered to drive back. I stayed and I decided on Saturday that I was going to drive back from Dallas into Houston much to the surprise of my family and friends. <laughs> but I felt like with my role at Texas Children's and with the Houston Fire Department, I had to drive back in. So initially, like Dr. Kazney said, when I drove in Saturday, the weather wasn't bad. It was raining a little bit, but the city didn't look like it had been flooded. And then when I woke up Sunday morning, we saw the extent of the flooding. And that's really when the preparation for the shelter started and all of the phone calls began. 
describe how a shelter like this would prepare. How much food, uh, water, cots, what do you need? Yeah, so the answer is you need all of the above. We did not have a good sense of where the shelter locations were going to be until Sunday. And one of the issues is as soon as it's announced that this convention center is now a shelter, people start showing up at the doors immediately, even before the Red Cross is there to provide cots, food. So when I got in Monday morning to the shelter, we had a meeting and there was a discussion that we had enough food to feed the 2,400 occupants that we had as of Monday through the evening and then after that we were going to be in trouble. So we had to look to the community, look to local grocery stores, other organizations, charitable organizations to provide food, water. Uh, there was a time when we ran out of cots. Uh, the capacity of George R. Brown Convention Center is about 4,000 people and within 48 hours we went from a few hundred to uh, about 10,700 people. Wow. So we exceeded the capacity of the shelter and that was not something that we had expected but you know, through the help of the Red Cross and other charitable organizations, we were able to get the supplies we needed. That's nice that everybody stepped up. Now, you mentioned that there was a, how close were you all in, in working with a central command or FEMA or a, a, a government organization? Uh, very close. So the Dr. Prince is the Public Health Authority for Houston. So he was in touch with, like I said, everybody on the federal level, but we were in close contact with the Houston Emergency Center, which was where the incident command was happening. So that's where all the representatives from federal organizations were seated to essentially coordinate all of the recovery efforts. The issue with federal resources is even once you request them, it certainly takes a while for them to arrive. So until the federal resources arrived, essentially what we had available to us is whatever the Red Cross provided and whatever resources and supplies the Houston Fire Department brought in. And it sounds like the community really kicked in and everybody pitched in and it, it seemed to work well. Is that right? Absolutely. I mean, it was it was pretty amazing. So like I said, the first 24, 48 hours, the only medications and medical supplies that we had or whatever is carried on a BLS or an ALS ambulance. And that was really all we were able to get to the convention center. But within a day or two, people started walking in with donations of food, clothing. We had several pharmacies just come donate medications and medical supplies. So it was a wonderful community effort. And this is when it's still raining. People's own homes are flooded, but they're walking to the convention center to bring in these donations. It never, and that's wonderful. I mean, it never fails to show you how good people really are, especially in a time of need. No, absolutely. It was, it was, it was very inspiring. To see. Now tell me, uh, for those listening, what is the job description for a medical director of a shelter? What do you do? Just about everything. <laughs> so my primary role at the shelter was actually not even providing as much direct medical care as enabling other providers to be able to provide that medical care. So much of what I did in that first 48 hours was calling companies to get donations of medical supplies, getting mobile pharmacies set up in the shelter, working with the public health department to get the patients in the shelter dialyzed. So a lot of it was logistics and coordination and you know, when I first walked in the medical area, there was a few chairs surrounded by some yellow caution tape and working with the folks at the convention center and everyone else, we were able to actually set up a disaster medical area with green, yellow, and red areas. We had transport units available to take patients to hospitals. So we were able to come up with a pretty sophisticated setup. The other two victories that we had really were that we had behavioral health services that we were able to set up in the shelter. And we created a program where patients who needed dialysis, we were able to transport them from the shelter to one of the local dialysis centers that opened up and then back to the shelter. So we reduced the burden on some of the local hospitals in that they didn't have to provide emergency dialysis for these patients. That's amazing. You were able to set up a behavioral health center. We had a behavioral health center. There was absolutely a need for it there. And what was wonderful about the behavioral health center is we had psychologists and psychiatrists who could talk to patients, but we also ended up with three mobile pharmacies set up actually inside the George R. Brown Convention Center. And so patients who needed medication refills, including psychiatric medication refills, could get their medications refilled at no cost while they were in the shelter. Was mostly what you were seeing people going through a lot of trauma, uh, stress, anxiety from what's going on? That was a lot of what we were seeing. And patients who received you know, psychiatric care on a regular basis who are now unable to receive that care. Much of the, many of the medical issues that we saw in the shelter were exacerbations of underlying chronic issues that okay. now weren't getting the routine care that they needed. How long were people in the shelter for? Oh, goodness gracious. So the 
people were in the shelter for approximately two weeks until we moved them to another shelter. Okay. Um, eventually, we got the population of George R. Brown Prevention Center down to approximately 12 to 1,500 people, and then we were able to find more long-term shelter options for those remaining folks who were unable to return to their homes. But it was people were there for weeks. And that's down from a starting population of 10,000, you said? Yeah, 10, 000, around 10,700 is was our peak. Wow. Now, you said most of what you saw medically was exacerbation of chronic medical conditions. I'm assuming like COPD or heart failure, or asthma. Was that basically what you all you saw or was there any more? No, so there was a variety. I mean, a lot of what we saw was exactly that. CHF exacerbation, COPD, but I saw several patients who, we saw a lot of patients with diabetes, who, okay. some of whom were in DKA. We had a few heart attacks, unfortunately, in the shelter. And oh, then just... So. You know, the usual emergency department conditions of trips, falls, sprains, lacerations. So you name it, we saw it okay. while we were there. Did you get any evacuees from nursing homes or any uh, uh, long-term chronic care facilities? So we did not get evacuees from nursing homes per se, but we had a lot of individuals who normally would have been living with a caregiver or in a, you know, with with somebody to assist in their care. So one of the other challenges we had in the shelter is we had to create an area, it's basically an assisted living area within the shelter itself. So oh. within about 48 to 72 hours, we had a federal medical station, which is a 250 bed subacute medical facility. And we actually used that as a long-term, you know, an assisted living area. But before that arrived, we created a separate area for patients who didn't necessarily have any medical needs, but had personal care needs or feeding needs. And was this all being staffed by volunteers or were people uh, stepping up, nurses or whatever, to help out? So initially it was staffed by volunteers and then what the city did was actually create agreements with the Baylor College of Medicine and University of Texas so such that all of the Baylor and UT physicians would be covered from a medical legal standpoint to work in the shelter. So once that agreement was in place, it was staffed by volunteer physicians still, but volunteer physicians from UT and from Baylor. That's amazing. And how many physicians did you oversee at the shelter? I can't even tell you the exact number. I will tell you the number of patient encounters we had was around 3,000. That's amazing. So we saw a substantial number of patients. And what was great is eventually, so we probably, I'm guessing if I had to estimate, we probably had about 30 to 40 physicians plus nurses, plus pharmacists. We had volunteers of all sorts there. And then eventually we transitioned care to the federal DMAT team, but still remained on site to help with transports and coordination of care. That's amazing. Now, one of the questions I had is, is let's say I was a community physician or an outpatient doctor and I was evacuated to a shelter. If I were to come up to you and say, I'm a doctor, can I help? Is that helpful or would that actually have gotten in the way? It absolutely is helpful, and I think it was great when we had individuals who came up and identified themselves. One thing that I think I learned throughout this experience is even if in your everyday life you are a physician and you are volunteering in a shelter, your role in the shelter may not be the role of a physician. Much of what I was doing was care coordination and getting supplies, so I think when you identify yourself, just be prepared to ask, how can I best help? And you might find that it's sorting medications or escorting patients somewhere. So you may not function in the role that you traditionally serve, but it's absolutely helpful. No, that sounds great. Now, on a lighter note, in terms of entertainment, you had to have had children and adults and everybody in one confined space for an extended period of time. What did you all have for entertainment? It was, it was actually fairly impressive. So in one of the halls, we had a play area set up for kids with donated books, toys, activities, coloring. There was an area for folks to watch television that was set up to keep up with the news and also just for entertainment purposes. So there were quite, there were quite a few activities. It was very impressive to see. Um, one of the great things that happened later on towards the end of the recovery process is people actually brought in therapy dogs. And so oh, wow. there were therapy dogs in the shelter just there to comfort people and provide support and it was just it was wonderful to see those sorts of resources come together it truly it sounds like a, a terrible experience but it really sounds like people just came together and the, you made the absolute best of that situation with all the services you had and provided no it, i think that really is a good way to describe it and one of the things that 
I was very impressed by is just the spirit of camaraderie. Everyone in the shelter, even though they had gone through such tough experiences, many of them have lost all of their belongings in their homes, is just watching them help each other out. It was truly amazing to see. You know, you had people who were watching other people's children, who were trying to help them in any way possible. And it was just amazing to see the camaraderie. And also to see the lighter side of things, to watch these children play with their families and to watch people who've been evacuated with their pets spend time with their pets. It was it was neat to see how people were coping with the situation and how they truly made the best of what would have been what was a very difficult situation. Now, it, and this is almost a redundant question at this point, because this really sounds uh, like a experience that really negatively affected a lot of people, but also in some ways a life-changing experience for everyone involved. But how did this affect you, uh, being at the shelter, affect you and your family personally, if you don't mind discussing that? Yeah, no, not, not at all. I, it definitely gave me a new perspective. It was interesting because, like I said, I chose to drive back into the city. My family and friends thought I was absolutely insane. But this is this is what we do. And just like Dr. Kasney said, our families understand that we went into this and this is a risk that we're willing to take and we want to be able to help others and want to be able to serve. But it definitely gave me a new perspective. I actually had a friend staying with me who had been evacuated from other places and it was tough to go home because I think, you know, and I was fortunate that I was able to go home from the shelter and I had a safe route to get home. But my perspective definitely changed and the little things in life didn't really matter as much anymore. So it just changed my perspective, right? It makes you see what's really important to be thankful for your safety, for having a warm, dry place to sleep, for having food, for having shelter. So it it definitely reinforced that for me. To me, you two are remarkable people. You went into this, you stayed there, you braved all the elements to help anyone you could. I, I think you really helped make a terrible situation better. And, you know, I'm not from Houston. I'm from Texas, but thank you for your work. Uh, now, let me just state, I don't know anything about disaster, disaster preparedness. I am not our disaster preparedness person at Children's in Pittsburgh. Uh, so they may have all this planned out, and I am completely uh, don't know about it. But, it's, uh, you know, hearing these experiences, I think, will help other hospitals, other facilities who may have to deal with something similar. I was going to say, and I think that we actually feel like, you know, Dr. Chaz and I both feel very lucky, and all the other physicians, nurses, providers who are able to help us, we feel very lucky that we were in positions that we were able to serve and help our community. I think that's a privilege to be able to do that. And I would also, I would also add that I think, you know, even though you're, you may be working in a facility where you're not the disaster person, the disaster guru or champion or what have you, I think going through something like this, obviously increases people's awareness of what emergency management does every day. And I think it's helpful from that standpoint. So hopefully listeners that are out there that may not be the disaster point of contact in their facilities are kind of interested or intrigued or curious as to what kind of planning is going on in their facility and then eventually and hopefully engage with emergency management in their facility. Because I do think there's a need for position leaders in, in this area um, it's something that at most places is largely an administrative role that has kind of little, if any, clinician input. And so I think having clinician involvement is obviously important because a lot of these decisions that they're making relate specifically and directly to patient care. So hopefully if there are people out there listening that are intrigued or curious, they reach out to those emergency management leaders at their facility and try to get involved and engaged. Now, I do want to ask one more question for you, Dr. Kazan. I'm going to move it up into the earlier part of the podcast. Um, and the question is, so normally at, the, at a children's hospital like yours and like mine, uh, whenever you're t- having patient care, there's also education. You're teaching residents, teaching med students, uh, nursing students, PA students, who, who, what have you. During the hurricane, during the flooding, when you all are trapped in there, was it business as usual? Was it rounding with the team? Was it teaching everyone? Or was there more, well, let's take care of the patients and we'll do the teaching later? So I'll tell you, I think some other of the unsung heroes of the Hurricane Harvey uh, ride-out team and experience at Texas Children's were our chief residents for, for the pediatric residency. So we had three chief residents that were on the ride-out team out of the four that, that are working every year. And they did a tremendous job. They actually had, on initially on the ride-out team Saturday morning, they had 57 residents present ready to ride out for three to five days. When we did that trade out of staff on Monday, 
they were able to get all of those 57 residents home and get a new batch of close to 50 residents back in place. We have a huge residency, as you can imagine, as I'm telling you these numbers. But the residents did a terrific job, and it was really business as usual as far as daily rounds. I would go around the hospital every morning and just go down from the top floor down and, and kind of chat with the residents and see how they were doing. And again, they all seemed in great spirits and, and really just did their what they would normally be doing. We did do some things. You know, there were times when the emergency center, as you can imagine, is difficult to reach, and so there's not a lot of patient care going on. In fact, on the day of the most significant flooding on that Sunday, we had a total of five patients come to present to our main emergency center. Oh. That's an emergency center that, you know, routinely sees up to 200 patients a day. So seeing five patients in a day is, needless to say, a slow day. So we were able to redistribute some of those residents to other areas of need, like the PICU and NICU, for assistance there. And they were all just very good sports about it. You know, hearing talk about kind of what are people doing and how are they entertaining themselves and things during these types of things. I, I'm reminded of the chief residents had a movie night every night in the hospital. Being pediatric residents, the first night they watched Moana. So <laughs> that's not to be too surprised. That's not too surprising. Uh, and then they did watch the Game of Thrones season finale in the hospital as well. Oh, good. So. They did have some kind of entertainment things playing at the hospital for staff and, and other people. They have like a karaoke night one night. Huh. So there were definitely, you know, it wasn't all hard work. There were there was downtime and some fun times were had uh, d- during that event. Well, that's I don't think there's a better way to end the podcast. That sounds, you know, it, it really sounds like the preparedness from your end uh, was absolutely stellar. Uh, everyone chipped in from the community to the residents of the med students. To the local pharmacies and really made this the best of the bad situation. So let me thank, uh, we're wrapping up the podcast for all those of you listening. I want to thank my guests again, Dr. Brent Kazany and Dr. Saranya Srinivasan. Thank you very much for being on the podcast. I truly appreciate your time and talking with us. I think this was great. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you for having us. No problem. And now for acknowledgments, I have to start out thanking Friend of the podcast, Dr. Ricardo Quinones, who's Hospitalist Medicine Division Director at Texas Children's Hospital in Houston, Baylor, because he got me in contact initially with Brent and Saranya. So without him, this would not have happened. I do also want to thank uh, Dr. Sarah McIntyre and Dr. Basil Zatelli, who helped me write and refine these questions to get the most out of this, what I think is a very special podcast. I do want to apologize to all of those of you listening. I am recording this after I record the podcast, and the sound quality, I've worked on it, it is not what I would like it to be. Uh, the conversation was absolutely excellent, and my guests were superb, and I think the issue was more on my end, but I'll do my best to work on it for next time. And in addition, I do want to say to those of you listening, uh, this was recorded prior to seeing how bad Hurricane Maria was going to be in Puerto Rico and how bad of a time Puerto Rico has had with recovery. Our deepest heartfelt sympathies goes out to everybody in Puerto Rico. And we definitely understand that that hurricane and the damage that it has caused is different from what happened in Houston and Harvey because of the infrastructure and other things that I really am not smart enough to get into. And of course, I want to thank, as I always do, Dr. Megan Keen Tarchichi, who helps me with everything. And the rest of the diagnostic referral group here at Children's Hospital for supporting me to do this. And the University of Pittsburgh, who usually offers free CME. But again, this time we are not offering free CME. Uh, We will pick up next time, continuing on the Pediatric Hospital Medicine Core competencies. I am not sure which one we are going to start with, so we will be discussing it. Please feel free to email me with any questions, concerns. If you have suggestions for topics you'd like us to try to get to at Tony. T-O-N-Y dot Tarchichi, T-A-R-C-H-I-C-H-I at chp.edu. Until next time, everyone have a great day.